Hello everyone, I'm Kavita Gupta. Welcome to the Nest Summit for Climate Week 2020 from Javits Center, New York City. Um, there was a time when we used to think of Amazon and an image of greenery, big rivers, exotic animals would come in your mind. But in last decade or so, the word Amazon reminds us of fire, burnt trees, smoke, illegal burnings, injustices towards indigenous population, and government, and corrupted government. Today, um, I have stalwarts who has been working in this space for over a decade to share with us what has been the transformation, why Amazon is very important, not only for that hemisphere, but for all of us around the world. I'm very excited to have Atosa Sultani with us. Atosa is the founder and board president of Amazon Watch, and she's the recipient of 2014 Hillary Step Prize. Hello, Atosa. Thank you so much for taking time out for us today. Thank you so much, Kavita. It's great to be here. Um, Atosa, the fires have increased in Amazon. It has gone 28% higher this year than last, which was considered the deadliest. Um, what has been happening there and why Amazon is so important for all of us that we should all think about it? Um, so yeah, Kavita, it's a great question. Uh, the people have heard of Amazon referred to as the lungs of the earth. Uh, really scientists are telling us it's more like the heart of the world as well. Um, the way the Amazon basically captures CO2, breathes in CO2 and breathes out oxygen uh, is why they call it the lungs of the earth. And now with science monitoring, seeing that the Amazon actually trees in the Amazon, billions of trees in the Amazon generate vapor and moisture into the atmosphere, that an average tree lifts up a thousand liters of water a day into the atmosphere. And collectively the trees in the Amazon generate these atmospheric rivers that drive rain and cool the planet or the air conditioner of the earth and the, uh, you know, the rain machine for the planet. In fact, uh, not only for South America, but for the entire um, continent and around the world. The moisture content, for example, over the Sierra Nevada and California is in part determined by rain patterns in the Amazon. So, um, so this is really a vital organ of the biosphere, uh, the heart and lungs of the earth, a vital organ that we cannot survive without. And so what's happened is that while there's, you know, wildfires in California, and we're all over the West Coast, actually, uh, this week, what we're seeing in the Amazon are man-made arson fires, fires that are set when the rain has diminished, you know, the rain's the dry season comes uh, after a long uh, period of actually chopping down the forest and letting it dry, they now set it on fire. So we are seeing an unprecedented set of deforestation and the fires are just basically the end result of all of that cutting and burn, and now they're set on fire. And yeah, it's been right now there's 35,000 fires happening in the Amazon. And this is so far since January until today, we have lost in the Amazon an area bigger than the state of Rhode Island, uh, a really huge area of the forest. And what we're seeing is this is as a result of policies of the Bolsonaro administration and basically uh, criminal uh, activities, illegal logging, illegal uh, cattle ranching, and policies by the government that encourage the, that people go out and burn and destroy the forest supposedly for economic livelihoods, but really uh, corporations, a handful of corporations benefit. And what we're seeing is the climate stability of the region is affected as is the climate stability for the entire planet because the amazon we can, it's basically the amazon is key to climate stability for the entire planet it is so sad like we are literally going and hurting a soul it feels like that for a human body um you know Atos, at this point because i want to connect this people who actually are from Amazon, the indigenous population. And I want to bring in Suzanne, uh, whom you know very well. Um, Suzanne Pelletier has been an executive director of the Rainforest Foundation since April 2009. She leads the work to partner with indigenous, popul uh, indigenous um, population in Central and South America to help them assert their rights and conserve their forests and natural resources. 
Uh, Suzanne, it's a pleasure having you here with us. A pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, what's going on with the population out there? We hear so much about, uh, you know, protests happening, uh, especially during the fire. Uh, what's been your report? Like, what's the updates from your end? Um, well, right now, I mean, Atosa just gave a really great overview of what's happening right now with the fires um, and how it's all stemming from deforestation and the indigenous people in, in the Amazon, they are the protectors of over a quarter of the entire Amazon basin. So they are directly affected by the deforestation that's been happening in the Amazon. They're really on the front lines of protecting the forest. Um, and which means that they're also on the front lines of these fires throughout, throughout the Amazon. Um, and right now, last, last year was tragic and was front page news. Um, right now, the end of August and in September. Um, and right now, and for, unfortunately, the fires, like Atosa said, are even larger this year. Deforestation has been larger, but the media and the indigenous people are suffering even more than last year, particularly because of COVID, the impact of COVID-19 also in their communities, but it's not on the front page of the newspapers anymore. Um, and the situation is, is even worse. Um, so what we're seeing um, is that communities are being adversely affected by, by COVID-19 and unfortunately, while many of us in, the, in around the world have been quarantined and sort of thinking that business stopped during um, during the epidemic, unfortunately, deforestation has skyrocketed for the communities in the Amazon because government wasn't looking, um, and they also weren't working as much and weren't actually investigating the illegal activity in the forest. So the communities have really um, been adversely affected right now from the deforestation, fires, and um, COVID-19. Wow. I think something which you said that it's not on the front page anymore. All these things are happening. Uh, you guys have been reporting about it everywhere on online and social media, but we don't see it on mainstream news channels. Um, I think at that point, I want to introduce two other uh, panelists who are influencers from their field. John Quigley, um, an amazing artist. He's the artist behind many powerful aerial photos installations, director of Artists for Amazonia, and on the board of EMA. We are very excited also to have Wendy Malik, uh, an American actress known for her roles in various television comedies like Dream On and Just Shoot Me. Um, and she's one of the founding circle, uh, founding partner uh, for Artists for Amazonia and on a board of EMA, um, and a very passionate climate activist working very closely for the cause. Uh, thank you so much for both of you to join us today. You're welcome. Thank uh, you, Kavita. So um, I'm, I'm basically connecting what Suzanne just mentioned. Um, it is not the front news anymore. Um, what can influencers like you, what can people across the world can do to start paying the much needed attention to this topic? Well, I think our, our job at Artists for Amazonia is to tell the story. And I believe the story of the Amazon and the fact that it's reaching a tipping point. And if we go through uh, the threshold of that tipping point, we will lose the Amazon and the function it provides for global weather stability. And so part of our job it has been reaching out to influencers, to storytellers of all sorts, whether it's directors, producers, actors, actresses, musicians, to elevate the Amazon in the climate story because climate stability depends on a healthy Amazon. And that's where uh, Wendy and I have been for years, she's been for decades now on the board of Environmental Media Association, which is about telling the environmental story. And now she joined our founding circle of Artists for Amazonia to help tell this specific story which is absolutely crucial right now. When you talk about climate, Amazon needs to be the next point because if we don't save the Amazon, everything else we're doing is not going to stop the climate chaos that's coming our way. 
go ahead, Wendy, please. No, and just uh, building on what John just said, what we took on at Emma and, and something, uh, which is a, a group, Environmental Media Association, is trying to be the voice for all these amazing people who are doing the work on the ground. So much of this is invisible to so much of the world, but once you know what's happening, you then can actually take action to try to prevent the madness and the destruction. You know, and right now, more and more, I think people are seeing around the world that the climate is changing very, very quickly. And at the source of all of it is the Amazon, which a lot of people don't realize. But as Atosa said, that is the heart and lungs of the planet. And without that, we are in even worse shape than we are now. So it's incumbent on all of us to start making some really smart choices, letting our voices be heard, elect leadership that will help us get on the right track, which we don't have right now. And we don't have any time to waste. I completely agree with you. I don't, I think it's an emergency. It's, it's urgency is undeniable. And, um, Especially this year with COVID, we see even much more, uh, you know, impact coming, uh, impact in the sense that there are no news coming from that space, also the local population. Uh, I feel like the atrocities are increasing. Um, what can we do uh, to basically help during, especially at this time, uh, which anybody around the world can just do it from where they are to help people out there? Well, I would suggest one thing is put your money where your mouth and your heart are. So for people who have any sort of investments, you can do this from home. Talk to whoever you invest with and make sure you're investing in sustainable businesses. There are corporations that are causing a lot of this destruction and harm. And if you care about this planet, you have to be a world citizen and really make meaningful choices about what you buy, where you put your money, what, what causes you choose to be on the front lines for and to make your voice heard. And one of the most important things people can do in this season is make sure you get out and vote and talk to your friends and family and colleagues and make sure they know what's at stake this time around because it is the very survival of this planet. Yeah, completely agree, November 3rd. Um, so I have a question for all of you actually. Um, uh, during your travels, in, um, to Amazon, um, can you share with us like one story or one incident which really completely changed the way you thought about the place or the issue um, and left a really lifelong impact on your life? I guess I can jump in. Uh, there's so many, it's hard to point to one. I've, I've had the honor and the um, and I'm really the privilege for 30 years to spend time in the Amazon, um, been there countless times. And, you know, the Amazon basin, just to give audience an idea, is, is um, at the size of the continental United States. It's massive. Uh, they, and it covers nine countries. I've been to um, seven of those nine countries and had have uh, the opportunity to work with indigenous peoples. I, w I would say the one of the most... Uh, powerful experiences is sitting with indigenous peoples in Ecuador, for example, um, I've also in many other places as well, and really learning from them, learning their knowledge of the forest, the way they relate to the forest as a sacred living entity that's alive, the way they see the forest as, uh, you know, where their ancestors are and where the unborn generations are. Uh, sitting in circle with them, what they do is dream ceremonies. We wake up 3 or 4 a.m., many, many mornings, you wake up early at that hour, drink a, a, a kind of a lightly caffeinated tea called Wayusa, and you share your dreams with the community, and everyone takes turn telling their dreams and getting an interpretation of what those dreams are. And they're focused on the dream culture. They They basically say, it starts very symbolic, but it has all this wisdom about how we're not going to get out of the problems we're in through some kind of a rationalization process. But we're going to get through this process through our heart connection, our relationships, and our, our envisioning the future in a way that is uh, really um, transformative, not just about changing one thing or another thing. And so 
and they see themselves, you know, they've taught me that, that um, the relationship is the most important, the relationship between the, among the community, the, between the community members and the forest, between various indigenous uh, nations that live there, and then the relationship with, of the Amazon with the world. And so um, I would say that uh, their message for us is to connect with, be indigenous to where you're from, be connected to the land where you are and care about it and think about the seventh generation ahead and seek to live in balance and in relationship with, with that earth. And I know it seems philosophical, but you know we can't change the system we're in until we change the focus of the system and part of changing um, the focus of the system is to have a, you know, deeper relationship, a deeper connection to recognize that, you know, just like the earth is a living organism and the Amazon is like the heart of the planet, that we ourselves are members of that community of life and can be contributing just like cells in a body keeps us alive. We can be contributing to keeping our forests, our communities, our rivers, our watersheds alive wherever we are. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's a really beautiful story. And I want that tea next time. <laughs> um, Suzanne? Um, I think I would say it's not it's similar to what <laughs> um, Atosa was saying, not one particular incident, but what has been reinforced to me over and over again as I've um, been in communities and talking with leaders is that connection and oneness with their with the environment. When we grow up in the United States, I never, I don't feel, I never grew up feeling that connection. It was almost a luxury, you know, nature was almost a luxury. But to really hear how they don't, you know, so many times they don't distinguish um, uh, the environment as different from their, from their community. It provides everything. It's part of a living system and you can't separate one from the other. You know, they will always say it's our for it's our pharmacy. It's our supermarket. It's our spirituality. You take, take it out and they lose who they are. Um, and so that has been a really impactful message that I've received from all of the communities that I've, that I've visited. Um, I think you're talking about the terminology which I've heard is like universal oneness, which I think in this country we have to really work to understand comparatively to those cultures where you are born with it and that's the part of your growing up. Mm -hmm. wow. um, John, Wendy, mm -hmm. an amazing story, an amazing mm -hmm. impact. Well, I will, two beautiful stories here and I have many as well. Uh, and I'm gonna recount a story that was the most hard hitting for me, which is traveling to Northern Ecuador to what they call the rainforest Chernobyl, uh, an area where Chevron, Texaco left a thousand unlined oil pits. And Atosa mentioned the state of Rhode Island. I remember this being uh, spoken to me that there was an area the size of Rhode Island where there was no drinkable water in the rainforest. And in 2007, I went there with Amazon Watch and their team and we toured, we did a toxic tour of these pits and met with indigenous people who all of them, they had lost children, they had lost parents, they had, there were birth defects, all from the toxic contamination of this, uh, this oil drilling that had been left behind just the, the mess. And it really was the mess of our civilization, of how we go about our lives on a daily basis. And seeing the pain in how paradise could be turned into this sort of living hell by what we put into our gas tanks every day, it really reinforced for me this commitment to work on behalf of, of the Amazon and nature and the spirit of the indigenous people that I've been blessed to meet is so, as, as both Atosa and Suzanne were talking about, there, there's this spirit of life. Um, 
and life affirming quality that just moves me to my core. And to see that desecrated by American companies who just had zero respect for human life or for nature, that left an indelible mark in my psyche and helps drive my passion to this day. That completely makes us question, like, as American, what are we doing? And, like, how are people still investing in those company stocks, knowing that there are, uh, you know, so many human right violations which are happening, and you still have them as a listed companies? Uh, but I, I think to that point, uh, I have never, I have not been to the Amazon. I told them I'm signing up for the next trip as soon as we're allowed to go. Uh, I have been to Brazil, and uh, but never quite made it to the rainforest. Um, but I think to your point, that's what a lot of people don't understand, is that they may be purchasing products and investing in companies that are causing this destruction. And it was something that was so moving to me at one of the first meetings we had was seeing some of the indigenous people who are defending, they're on the front lines of the Amazon. and seeing their courage and this kind of gravitas that they they had and knowing that they are willing to die for this and there are people who are dying on the front lines trying to protect this thing that we all benefit from this living organism that is the amazon and just being in the room with them i was very aware of being in the presence of something quite remarkable and extraordinary and a kind of courage that i have rarely rarely seen a kind of a kind of commitment to doing whatever it took to try to save this precious resource that we all depend on whether we understand that or not yeah i think before i go to call for action um i again suzanne asoda i i really want to come back and ask you you have been there some multiple times you have been working on this like dedicated your whole life to the mission um have you seen any improvement over the years or have you seen only things being deteriorated over the years? Oh, I think what, what gets us, what gets me through the day is seeing things that actually work and progress. And um, there's absolutely been improvement in certain things. One, the, the indigenous movement over the past two decades, we, we, Rainforest Foundation has been around 30 years um, the movement has has become so much stronger in Latin America. Um, so, and to really see their voices heard in forums and in places that they, they never were 30 years ago is inspiring and progress. Um, to see recently, even in, you know, at the international level, to hear multinational companies, you know, consulting with indigenous people, to hear governments, um, in engaging with indigenous peoples. Now, granted, it has a need. We need. We still need a lot more work, um, but there has really been a lot of progress on the advocacy front, for sure. Um, and then there's um, progress at the local level, also. Um, you know, something that we've been working on a lot at Rainforest Foundation that's really given me a lot of hope is um, doing engaging in, with um, techn technology training at the community level with indigenous peoples. Um, and we're seeing incredible results um, of using, you know, over the past 10 years or so, there's, there's very inexpensive user-friendly technology that can be integrated with traditional knowledge and practices at the local level that in combination is protecting forests. Um, and so what we've done is we're working with the indigenous federations and leadership um, to be able to take remote sensing data of deforestation in the Amazon and to, to put that into simple maps and train community level monitors to then be able to take that information and be much more efficient in the way that they, they monitor their territories. And that integration of taking the satellite data to make it efficient at the local level, communities that don't have Wi-Fi or um, or cell service, they, they couldn't access that data that we can access here in New York in my office. I can go on Google Earth and go on you know, other platforms and see what's happening in their territory and they didn't know it. 
Um, and so now on a monthly basis, we're engaging with these communities to give the bring them maps of where deforestation is happening, enabling them to use these simple smartphones um, now to take video and photo evidence of the illegal activity on their territory, then bring it to their communities and the community elders and um, the community assembly can decide what they want to do, whether they want to take to take matters into their own hands at the local level or if they feel that it's too dangerous or too large a scale where they need to engage the the government and by doing that that combination it's protecting forests so i really see that as a model it's inexpensive and something that can be scaled across the amazon so i'm i'm um, hopeful about that wow. I'm, I'm very excited about this technology and it's a combination of AI and blockchain, which you use over there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, now we're, we're beginning to integrate blockchain technology because we're really looking to create a system that is transparent um, and immutable so that the evidence that communities are, um, are producing can be really taken seriously and trusted. And so that's why we're integrating. We're just we're using the technology that we feel is the most effective. And so blockchain, because of the characteristics of um, um, immutability and um, transparency, we feel that it would it's important to integrate those those two, um, and hopefully disrupt some systems um, that right now are are preventing finance from getting to people at the community level that are actually protecting the forest. Money from international money is often never reaches the people that are actually doing the work. And so we're really trying to create a system that in order for forests to be protected for the long term, they need resources. And so we're trying to develop ways using technology where the resources can get directly to the people that are implementing the technology and saving forests. And that would become that would be absolutely revolutionary when it happens because that technology can be used across the world for similar communities across right. Africa, Middle East, and I think uh, you would do a big favor to a lot of other <laughs> countries too with that. Um, Atosa, um, with you from your experience. So uh, I agree with a lot of what Suzanne said. I mean, I'm, I think uh, 30 years ago when I started this journey, um, very few people had heard about the rainforest. And today people know about the rainforest, about the Amazon rainforest. Uh, we have in the last 15 years, the United Nations adopting Indigenous Peoples Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. You know, we have lots of companies get making commitments to deforestation free supply chains, although not hardly enough. So on, a, on one, uh, we've learned what works in terms of public policies and programs. Indigenous peoples are more connected, they're stronger. So I would say there is a greater awareness and a lot more policies. Uh, so at one level, we are making huge progress. On the other level, our economic system, the global financial and economic system has grown exponentially. And as it has expanded and expanded uh, to the current stage, it has become, it's basically an economic system that's life blind and is devouring the resources of the planet at a greater and greater scale. So while we're making advances on, on one front, the larger economic system is becoming a bigger and bigger threat to all of our survival. The money dominated life blind system that's based on growth, infinite growth is really undermining everything. And what we need is a life centric system uh, that is basically honoring life honoring economic system that values uh, you know, biological systems and human health and planetary health and that's what we're trying to transform to. So the Amazon's reaching a tipping point. Um, the, the, it's reached a point where um, the deforestation has reached a certain level around which a tipping point begins the unraveling of that hydrological system I was talking about. So the flying rivers, those atmospheric rivers being disrupted or off course, uh, the forest becoming more prone to fires, uh, more drying, more edge effect, and that we're seeing a dieback of the Amazon. If we continue on the current trajectory, we will see a collapse and a dieback of the Amazon over the next five to five to ten decades. But really, that point of crossing to an, the unraveling is in the next five to ten years. So we, what we do in the next five to ten years, will determine the course of the Amazon for the next hundred years, a thousand years. So we are in a you know, 
tipping point of ecological unraveling and an urgency. We need to declare a state of emergency. We need to recognize I'm part of a panel of scientists of 170 scientists, mostly from Amazon countries. We're coming up with a, basically a definitive study of what it's going to take to protect the Amazon biome. We need a global treaty that says we cannot just, you know, we cannot allow the forest to collapse. And so we need a much stronger path forward. Although with their, as I agree with Suzanne, most of the solutions that we need are there. We just have to change the operating system from one that uh, where money values dominate to one where life values will dominate. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Atosa. You basically give so much uh, for thoughts, food for thoughts. Um, very quickly in the end, I would love to have a quick call for action for everyone out there watching it. What can they do? Well, um, I'll just start saying, you know, the, um, Wendy mentioned a lot of it as be the person who cares about ecological health, planetary health, and whether it's the Amazon or your backyard. So that everything from who you vote for, who you uh, buy from, where you invest your money and what you consume. In fact, beef, cattle ranching and beef is a huge part of Amazon destruction. So we've got to take on our own personal consumption, but we also have to exercise our muscles as global citizens. We have to um, target companies like BlackRock, mm -hmm. who are um, one of the biggest investors in Amazon destruction, but really not stop there. Learn more, you know, join groups like Amazon Watch and Rainforest uh, uh, Foundation and also support the Amazon Emergency Fund. If you have an ability to make donations, indigenous peoples are uh, in, uh, facing multiple emergency, both climate and COVID and forest fires. And so uh, what we're trying to do is, through the Amazon Emergency Fund, we've come together as a movement, as an alliance of many organizations, raising money for frontline communities to get emergency aid to address their immediate COVID and uh, fire um, response. Thank you. Anything, anybody wanna cover? Uh, I, I would just say that we're in the process of developing an Amazon rainforest platform for the election that we're gonna be reaching out to candidates to endorse and to pledge that they will support legislation that that protects the Amazon. And there's a great example in Los Angeles where the LA city council uh, created a resolution to stop purchasing from rainforest destroying companies the stop the use of public funds for that so keep a lookout for that there will be a way through artists for amazonia and amazon watch to to understand who's running in the various races who act that that have publicly committed to protecting the amazon through their policies I just want to add, add one thing um, is that this is, you know, your vote and your advocacy is not theoretical. It's real. And I just want to give the example of Brazil, where in Brazil from 2004 to 2014, Brazil decreased their deforestation rate by 75%. And a lot of that had to do with public policies, both having people in power that created public policies that were effect, then Im actually implementing those policies, not just having them on the books, which so many countries have, but actually enforcing them and really integrating technology to make sure that they were monitoring um, the effectiveness of those policies. So those, the three combination of those three things worked and it worked very quickly. So it can happen, it can happen. In the United States too. <laughs> we have hope. Um, I would just, I would just. Say